Antimicrobial resistance or drug resistance is one of the top five human health threats. That's when viruses, bacteria, and fungi can no longer be killed by the drugs that were designed to deal with them. According to the World Health Organization, drug resistance will kill more people than cancer, diabetes, and cholera combined. And when it comes to surgery, self-infection of a surgical site is a big problem. You see, your nose is home to many harmful germs and even superbugs, and is a leading source of healthcare-associated infections. In the U.S., up to 60% of hospitals remove these nasal germs with topical antibiotic pre-surgical nasal decolonization for major surgeries, and they do this to reduce the likelihood of surgical site infections. Now, despite challenges that include low patient compliance, a five-day treatment regime, and increasing antibiotic resistance, numerous randomized controlled trials indicate a 40 to 60% drop in these hospital-acquired infections. And it's for this reason that the World Health Organization recommends this pre-surgical treatment for ortho, spine, and cardiac surgeries. Interestingly, in Canada, only Vancouver Coastal Health requires universal pre-surgical nasal decolonization for all of its major surgeries. Now, they do this using Vancouver's on Dean company's photo disinfection technology, a six-minute painless procedure. The infection reduction results have been significant over the past nine years since the health authority first implemented this kind of technology. The addition of eliminating nasal pathogens with the photo disinfection just minutes before surgeries has contributed to a 80% reduction in serious infections. To date, more than 1,000 patients have been spared from post-surgical infections, saving millions of dollars annually. On Dean and Vancouver Coastal Health are now exploring if this same nasal decolonization treatment can be used to help prevent or treat COVID-19. We invited Carolyn Cross of On Dean Biomedical to join us for a conversation that matters about the laser treatment her company has been developing to reduce surgical site infection rates. Conversations That Matter is a partner program of the Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the following and viewers like you. Please become a patron at conversationsthatmatter.tv. Carolyn Cross, welcome to Conversations That Matter. Um, you are, through your organization, through your scientific endeavors, uh, taking on a challenge that I think could be monumental, and, may, and probably a lot of people don't realize is coming, and, and that is the uh, ability of so many of the bugs that we thought that we had conquered through antibiotics to adapt and change and come back resistant. Yeah. How big of a problem is it? Right now, it's about $2 billion a year problem in Canada. It's going to move to a $20 billion problem. Um, in, in the world, 700,000 people are losing their lives to infection. In 30 years, that's going to be 10, uh, 10 million people, and that's going to be more than cancer, diabetes, and uh, cholera combined. Quite a lot of people. And the same time, as the bugs are moving forward and becoming more resistant, our manufacturers of new antibiotics are, are getting out of the business and the money going into new development is rapidly disappearing because of that very fact of, of resistance that generates so quickly and so easily. So yeah, it's as though there's little value in developing a drug that is not going to have a long enough uh, efficacy life. Right. Um, and so it, this requires that we take new steps you have been moving in that direction for quite some time using what, from my layperson's perspective, appears to be a cold laser light technology. Mm -hmm. Do I have that right? Yes, you do. Yeah. Red light. Red light. Cold red light. <laughs> cold red light. <laughs> so let's talk about uh, what it is, uh, and in particular, why it's so important to target the nose. Okay, two very big questions. Yes. Uh, first of all, we call it photo disinfection. I'm going to give a plug to Professor Michael Wilson, University College London, who invented this back in the late 80s. Interestingly, for Eastman Kodak, when Kodak thought it might be into medical devices. Mm -hmm. So it goes back 
since the mid 80s when they understood at that time that antimicrobial resistance was going to be a problem. It was developed for gum disease and oral infections. And what the technology is, is a double combination of um, a liquid photosensitizer that is placed on the bugs, shining uh, red light for a few minutes with the right amount of energy and wavelength. And that combination creates a free radical that targets the bugs that have been covered by that photosensitizer. Instantly, we can kill bugs, whether it's virus, bacteria, or fungus and it is uh, safe for human tissue, and so we've discovered. Mm -hmm. Why the nose? I'm glad you asked, because the nose <laughs> is, is one of the last reservoirs, main reservoirs of self-infection when you go into hospital. We're cleaning the body, we're cleaning the skin, but we're not cleaning the nose, and the nose is warm and moist, perfect breeding ground for bacteria, virus, fungus, to hang out, and when a person is down and out, immunocompromised because of surgery, that's when the bugs recognize that the host is down and out. They change their behavior, something called quorum sensing, and the body's immune system is weakened. So that double whammy uh, makes someone susceptible for infection. The other group that's a vector of infection um, in the hospital are the healthcare workers. So the healthcare workers, of course, are exposed to these deadly bugs day in, day out. They bring it home, they bring it into the communities, and they're. Um, they have a difficulty because uh, they need to find a way to decolonize in a way that's going to be safe each and every time that they're doing it and not build up resistance for themselves. Up to this point, we've been using antibiotics uh, as a way of dealing with this microbial uh, infections uh, or fungi, viruses, and so on. Uh, if the resistance to those antibiotics uh, increases amongst all of those microorganisms. Um, and we're asking you as the host to keep taking stronger and stronger doses. Um, everything that we now understand about the microbiome is that you're killing off a tremendous amount of beneficial uh, microbial life as well. So how does this help us to also address the fact that, you know, the host, meaning the human body, isn't being affected adversely? That is uh, another great question. It's the issue of commensals. How do we target just the bad bugs and leave the good guys behind? Mm -hmm. That's really uh, what, you're, what you're asking. Unlike antibiotics, uh, systemic antibiotics, for instance, that targets the entire body, we target just the area that needs to be decolonized. And so that targeting limits the exposure of the whole body. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, yes, the bacteria that may be good in that area are going to be vulnerable to the treatment, but it's the commensals that repopulate first. They are hardwired and, and genetically evolved to favor that body part, whether it's inside the sinus, inside the nose. And so we find it's the commensals that are coming back first. Maybe in the future there will be a microbiome replacement uh, therapy mm -hmm. that would supplement that. But for now, we have observed that the commensal bacteria are repopulating earliest and the pathogens take longer to reestablish themselves. And so we're just, we're just letting nature take its course. So it's my understanding that in the United States they are actually targeting the nose, not using your technology widely, but they are targeting the nose, but we don't do it here as a rule in Canada. Why? What's the difference? Um, so about 60% of U.S. hospitals will um, decolonize patients' noses before coming into a surgery, and that is not the same case in Canada. Uh, it goes to studies that happened around 2000, in that time frame. We observed that when we did nasal decolonization, antimicrobial resistance rapidly accelerated, and I think the Canadians, quite correctly, were concerned about resistance. And so they decided, not only just the resistance, but they also decided and observed that patients weren't complying with the treatment anyways. So if you're not going to follow a regime, you're not going to be treated at the end of the outcome, and you're not going. And you're going to generate resistance. It was two of the worst worlds. So mm -hmm. the Canadians, um, as a rule of thumb, had not undertaken nasal decolonization, and so that's why we've got the gap. 
So how does it work? Right now it's in a pre-surgical environment and it's in British Columbia, although we've got um, We've got our, our dibs and fingers in some hospital groups uh, in Ontario and also Quebec. Uh, we are talking to Alberta, but most importantly, uh, it just the way it is, we are going in front of the US FDA. We have um, some excellent partnerships with a very large hospital group in the US that is keen on this kind of technology and bringing that forward. We're also working with the CDC and as a result, that'd be a wonderful way of uh, validating and endorsing an incredible new approach to nasal decolonization that answers the concerns that the Canadian healthcare system has. And we'll go in the U.S. and then bring it back home once we've established ourselves there. Well, because approval by FDA is the gold standard, it's isn't it? It's the gold standard, yeah. So once you go through that process, how long... Well, Let's not jump ahead of ourselves. How long do you think it will take to uh, navigate your way through that that environment, the regulatory environment with the FDA? Well, we have fast track designation um, and a qualified infectious disease product status. So that gives us an accelerated review, an accelerated process. We're still in negotiations with the uh, FDA. I do not want to uh, jinx these negotiations by no. being aggressive. But I think... Um, if we say we have a lot of real-world data coming out of Vancouver General Hospital and UBC hospitals, I think there are more than 45,000 patient uh, data statistics, uh, excellent uh, safety record, great uh, efficacy. We'll bring that real-world data to the FDA and negotiate um, what we are going to need to do. It's one thing to get through FDA approval. It's another thing to get validation and enough critical mass mm -hmm. to make sense for the other hospital groups to adopt. But we think that the combination of the FDA review and regulatory milestones, as well as that real world data coming out of British Columbia, that, that we should get accelerated traction and adoption in the US. There are people who are gonna be listening to this who have chronic sinusitis or whatnot who are going, well, what about me? Well, <laughs> how do I get that treatment and when can I get it? For sure, uh, we're targeting the chronic sinus groups. Uh, about 35% of people carry Staphylococcus aureus on the bottom of their noses and every time a clinician is instrumenting them, checking out, seeing what's going on, uh, they are translocating pathogens, and that for some people is going to be problematic. So we see the future evolving that a patient coming in uh, to such a clinic is going to decolonize the bottom of their nose first, to decolonize as much of the, the problematic pathogens, and secondly, after that, they will have a photodynamic treatment for chronic sinusitis we have a balloon-based version of that uh, nasal decolonization to treat the underlying disease and inflammation and biofilm uh, in the chronic sinus patients. This is not just a, a dream because if we take a look back through the history of your, your company and the history of this technology, you say, which goes back to the 80s, it started with periodontal or dental um, uh, applications. Where are you at? in that, and because I believe that, that you have products that are out in the marketplace that dentists uh, can now employ. So let's talk about the progression of that to give hope to anybody who's saying, I want to see you succeed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Me included. <laughs> <laughs> well, our first product, you're right, is for gum disease and implantitis. We had sold, we uh, developed that one and sold that one off, and that is in the marketplace right now. We chose to do that so that we can focus on the hospital-acquired infection space and also chronic sinusitis space. Those markets are huge. People are dying. People are suffering, and we wanted to target our efforts there. But what we do have is at least um, 15 years of deployment on the dental space and clinical experience. We're still very good friends with a lot of the clinicians that are out there with the dental product, and we can see what is done for its, the patients and the practices um, over the long term, good things. So, you know, there hasn't been the adverse events or the serious problems that one might encounter five years out, 10 years out, now 15 years out, 
we see some incredibly interesting clinical outcomes that we can learn from and then migrate our new developments um, accordingly. And so it's, it's a good place to start. Well, in my research, I was reading about some of the testimonials that came from people about having had the periodontal uh, work done with, uh, with the wand, I guess the, the laser wand, and the results almost seem astounding. Um, and why is that? What is it that is happening that allows for this light laser technology to do something that, you know, a normal approach to periodontal disease doesn't, which, interestingly enough, also uh, involves the use of antibiotics if we look at the traditional way of dealing with periodontal disease. In fact, 13% of antibiotic use is of that. I'm not a fan of antibiotic use for long-term uh, gum disease treatment because I think it's the wrong use of it. But the, uh, the reason why we've got such great outcomes is because the technology also inactivates the inflammatory cytokines. So if you can address inflammation, the body's response to the bacteria, virus, and fungus, and get rid of that bio load, the pathogens are eliminated. Com the combination of that allows the body to kind of reset, and it, we get accelerated healing. It's really interesting that way. Mm -hmm. So let's come back to what you're working on right now. Let's say I am presented with uh, the opportunity to be uh, one of the, the test subjects. What might I experience when I am going to be subjected to this treatment? What does it look like? Well, uh, <laughs> what what application? Shall we do the nasal the, one? Nasal, yes. Okay. Yeah. So you're about to go into surgery, and you're actually worried because one in five, actually the Canadian statistics is one in 10 people going into hospital will have a hospital-acquired infection, and the primary source is the nose. So you're coming in about to have a cardiac surgery, and we are going to address your nose and address your concern. What we're going to do is, and it's a nurse that does this uh, pre-operation, mm -hmm. we'll take a swab, will uh, and the swab is pre-filled and will um, deploy the swab in the nose yeah do a few circles of it and then we bring in a light source it looks like a thimble diffuser tip we put it into the nose we turn the light on for two minutes that's the treatment you don't feel a thing you don't smell a thing it's bright red and we do that one more time just to make sure that we've got everything in case there's hair follicles or they didn't get enough uh, of a treatment the first go around. Five minutes all in all and you're done, you're clean and you go off to get your surgery. Eh. Simple as that. It seems remarkably easy but I'm sure that the development of the technology was anything but because to know that you've gonna, that, that you hit that sweet spot with just the right frequency of, of light Right. Um, must have been quite a bit of work. Did most of that work take place here in, in Vancouver, or was it uh, UK-based, where you say that the technology was first envisioned what we, or created? Yeah. What we got out of the UK was the photosensitizer and the, the wavelength, so we understood that. And then what we had to work with is power density, and we had to work with concentration, uh, energy concentrations, and um, formula concentration. So we did a number of um, experiments and trials in Canada, also at Foothills Calgary Hospital. Mm -hmm. and, and then we went into the Vancouver General Hospital knowing that we had the right combination. Are tests still underway? Well, there will be new trials starting up for the FDA. So mm -hmm. that's gonna be coming up in the first quarter of 2020, mm -hmm. 2020. Yeah. And uh, in Canada, we have been approved since about 2000, 2008, 2009 in, in several hospitals in British Columbia. And now, interestingly, plastic surgeries uh, clinics in, in Toronto. So they've gotten on board. Obviously, infection is a problem for people having plastic surgery infections. And in order to accelerate healing, which is what... Uh, plastic surgery patients want to have uh, that that came out of left field and it was quite a delightful placement so we are going to be exploring uh, the opportunity to 
bring that out into more standalone clinics. So in under the circumstances where you're going into surgery or in some uh, plastic surgery uh, outlets, uh, just to make sure that I understand this, you can have this, you can get this treatment in Canada. Yes. Not in the United States yet, but no. but in Canada. Yes. It's remarkable. And we're also trialing in the UK as well. It's a global challenge. It's a global healthcare challenge. It is. It's a top five global health threat, according to World Health Organization. It's uh, going to be such a serious socio-political topic. It has been, it is right now, but it will become more and more socialized as we are observing the baby boomer bubble going through their various hips and knee replacements and more and more of us getting infections when we go down there. So I can uh, see the application in the nose because, well, I can get there. What do you, uh, where do you go from here? How do you take this technology and apply it to other aspects of our, our body's ability to uh, provide a, a home for viruses, fungus, and, and, and so on? We looked at hospital-acquired infections as the place that really needed uh, the most help. When you're developing something brand new that the world has never seen, the best place to start is in the areas that nothing else works. That's where the demand would be the highest, mm -hmm. as opposed to replacing something that works well enough. And so one of the areas um, that needs a lot of help is hospital-acquired infections. They're already doing the antibiotics, they're doing prevention, they're doing hand washing as best as they can, and they still have an issue. Right. So we're looking at the five major types of hospital-acquired infection, the most Common is uh, urinary tract infections, catheter-associated uh, UTIs. So we've got a program for that, working with University College London. We have ventilator-associated pneumonia prevention. Wow. So people who are on long-term breathing assist, that is a big problem because a those bugs Perfect grow. culture, right. Perfect <laughs> environment for the bugs to grow and then dump right into the lungs. One in five people will get a ventilator-associated pneumonia called VAP. One in five of those will die. Hmm. It's the highest source of death rate in hospitals. Um, then there's central line catheter infections from the, the surface of the skin. And then we are looking for um, internal things like uh, C. difficile. So going and taking specific or H. pylori super resistant bacteria that we can use balloon technology to go in and decolonize high concentrations of these pathogens uh, using this kind of technology. Like to go right into the gastrointestinal tract and go after C. diff. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming in and sharing this. Thank with you us. so much, mm -hmm. Stu.